Dr. Ecker shared with you last night was that there's been a misunderstanding when it comes to calling, that we have bought into a system separating the secular and the sacred, and we have determined, therefore, that they, certain things in life apply to some people and certain things apply in life to others. But when we saw in First Peter, as Dr. Ecker shared with us, is that we are a kingdom of priests, and so therefore we are uh, co-equal in this role that's here, and we have this impact that's on each other's lives, and we are called all into a ministry setting. Um, what's going to change sometimes is the way you earn your paycheck, if you might want to put it that way. Uh, but yet it's all going to be called into uh, this form of ministry. I had a pastor growing up one time that used to make the statement. He says that uh, uh, your job is just a, a way to support your personal ministry um, and the way that God has called you into work into those particular settings that are there versus ministry is for some people and then others are recipients of it. So when we generally talk to people and we ask about how their week went, the common response that you might get is, oh man, it was busy. That's the common response you might get. You might get good, you might get there, but frequently you'll get, oh, it was busy. Matter of fact, my week this week was such that I, I sometimes wondered whether I was actually qualified to give this talk as I looked at all the things that were on my plate. Let me just kind of give you a preview of what I had on my plate this week. When we had church Sunday and I left church and uh, to get ready to go to a donor event at school that evening, and then on Monday to go to some more donor events, and then to our board of trustees meeting, and then to another donor event on Monday night, back to board of trustees meetings on Tuesday morning. Uh, on Tuesday afternoon, spending time class prepping, I'm teaching a new class, and anybody that's taught a new class always knows that you're just about a day ahead of the class. That's all you're doing when you're doing new class prep. So I'm doing new class prep because I know I've got a busy Wednesday and Thursdays when I'm teaching class and I have to be ready for it. And so Wednesday, I wake up and I have a, a, a direct report meeting and then I have a leadership team meeting. Then I've got more class prep to get ready and then I teach class. And I got to that place on Thursday afternoon after a series of meetings that were there and I thought, okay, something's got to give. Something's got to give on Friday. So I had a leadership training meeting on Friday morning, canceled. I'm like, this is not helpful. It's not helpful for my sanity. It's not helpful uh, for doing all the things that need to be done and to be focused properly on what's actually in front of me. I'm not sure what your week looked like, but most of the time what we do is we will fill in whatever blank spots that are there with something and it becomes busy. So therefore, when we answer the question, how was your week, we generally default to the word busy. Matter of fact, we spend most of our life, if you might want to say, in a reactive model instead of a proactive model. We're just simply, as things coming, this is how it is that we are living our life at this moment versus thinking forward. But yet, what we're trying to do this weekend is reframe the way that you think about things. What Dr. Ecker, Ecker said is reframe the way that you think about your life and what I'm going to be talking about is reframing how you order your life in light of that particular calling. So you might generally think of your life as like this pie. You slice this pie up in all different kinds of ways. And there's this piece of pie that's left over at the end. And that piece of pie that's left over at the end is what you set aside for God or it's what you set aside for interaction with your local church, or it's what you set aside for interactions with the body of Christ. But what I'm going to put forward to you today is that's not how it is that God has designed this to work. This is not a piece of the pie that's left over, and it is definitely not the last slice of pie as you figure out everything else in life. You know, when you think about pie, you've got a crust and you've got filling and You've got all kinds of ingredients that go in it, and you can have a pie that's a pie, but it's not an apple pie unless there's apple all throughout. That's the way you look at it. You can look at it, and somebody can say that's an apple pie and say, no, it's not an apple pie. There's no apples that are in it. And what distinguishes is the fact that the apples invade everything when it comes to that pie. And that's what I put forward to you from a Christian is your calling 
It's not that your calling is a slice of this pie, but it literally pervades everything you do in life. It reaches into every area of your life and informs how those other pieces of pie of the pie are used versus just simply being a slice of the pie. Now, there's many different ways that we can slice the pie. Let's, let's take this analogy of the pie and let's say, okay, the apples, our, our calling that we have that Christ has in our life is going to pervade all areas of our life. And there's many different ways that we can slice the pie. There's all different kinds of things that we have. We have family, we have work, we have church, we have stuff that we do with the kids, we have uh, other, other hobbies that are out there. There's all kinds of things that do those things, but what I want us to do is slice the pie a little bit different because you're going to find these categories in all three of these particular things. And this is not a some new language that is used in these. This is things that have been used throughout the church for years as we have talked about how it is that we steward these things, that the resources and the time and the calling that God has given us. But this is how we're going to slice the pie this morning. We're going to slice it in three different ways and look at it in three different ways. We're going to look at stewarding our calling in the way of our time. We're going to look at stewarding our calling in the way of our talents. We're going to look at stewarding our calling in the way of our treasures. So these are the three ways that we're going to slice this pie. And I say there's all different kinds of parts of your life that are going to go into this. So stewardship is this. When we talk about stewardship, stewardship is simply saying you are a manager of something that you don't own. That's what stewardship is. You are a manager of something that you don't own. So as we talk about stewarding our calling, you remember that this is a calling that we haven't come up with. This is a calling that God has placed on our life. And therefore, we are a manager of this calling versus owning that calling. Matter of fact, when I teach, especially in the finance world, but this applies to all areas of stewardship, I use three O's. I call it the three O's of stewardship that's here. You got to kind of order these rightly for them to work rightly. And the first one's at the bottom, and it's that you establish ownership. The fact that God owns everything and that it's his. And so when you do that, it changes the way you think. Just like if you go to the beach and you stay at someone else's beach house, you treat it different than if it's your beach house because you're stewarding that usage of that resource that has been given to you because it's not your own. At least if you're a decent human being, you treat it different. (laughs) But you are stewarding something that is not your own at that point in time. And then after you established ownership, get your head thinking right about the fact that these are not things that you own These are things that have been entrusted to you. Then what you start looking for is the outcomes. And the outcomes are this. The outcomes are the things that Scripture explicitly says. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Scripture's filled with all of these kinds of things of do this, don't do that. And it's our responsibility to make sure that if Scripture says do it, that we do it. And if Scripture says don't do it, that we don't do it. It's the calling that's been placed in our life. But then there's a whole host of areas out there. You might refer to them as gray areas, or you might even think of them as neutral, but I want to propose to you they're not neutral. Had a professor one time that made the statement, every issue is a spiritual issue, and I I firmly hold to that particular statement. And that's where the last O comes in. That's the opportunities that we have. The opportunities to apply biblical wisdom, godly wisdom to the decisions that we make in areas where Scripture doesn't explicitly say, do this or don't do that. A significant part of your day is filled with those particular things. And what we are doing is we are asking God for wisdom to say, how is it that we order and arrange our life that we are stewarding the calling the way that he has told us or that he wants us to steward our call? So let's first of all look at stewarding our calling and our time. We're going to call this stewarding our calling our time as moving from frazzled to faithful. This is where it is that we live our lives in a lot of ways, frazzled. We're we're in that reactive. We're just trying to keep up. We're trying to keep our head above water. So we want to move from a spot where we go from frazzled to faithful as we steward this calling in our time. This is the busyness that we experience. And we're going to start with time in this discussion of the others because it's this universal commodity that we all have. You all have, unless the Lord calls you home, 
You all have 24 hours in a day. Everyone does. It's the universal commodity that we all equally have access to when it comes to what happens in the day in front of us. And when we use this time, we're looking at how it is that we use it, knowing that this time is God's time, that he has called us to steward. And so therefore, how is it that we properly order it? You know, we've even gotten to a place where our downtime is not really even downtime anymore. Think about how it is that you or many others use their downtime. You can be sitting there on the porch with God's beautiful creation around you, and you have your phone up, and you're just scrolling. Things consuming our time that aren't helpful at those particular moments. And it's not that I'm saying that you walk away from things like social media and those items, but yet it consumes our time in such a way that it controls what happens during our day. I think back to the start of the pandemic. It was an odd time at the start of the pandemic. Everyone had time. Everyone was at home. There wasn't the busyness of kids and sports and work and all the other kinds of things. And a lot of people struggled as to what to do during that time. Shifted to binging on Netflix. You might have watched three or four shows in those first couple of weeks is everything that was there, because we're just looking for something to fill the time versus how it is that we order the time. Kevin DeYoung, in a book that I would recommend that you look at called Crazy Busy that came out in 2013, uh, this is not a new concept, uh, talks about how it is that we have to look at our lives and fight against the tyranny of the urgent and focus on what's most important as we order these things in our life. The truth is most of the things that we do and that we fill our schedule with don't have to be done or they don't have to be done at that particular time. But yet we determine as we order things that they do. So let's look here at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. One of the calls. We were last night, uh, as one of the passages that Dr. Ecker was in, we were uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 as he talked about the calling talk about some of the gifts, and Paul is continuing this discussion as we get into chapter 5. And in chapter 5, Paul says this, he says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, or your translation might say, redeeming the time, might be used to that particular term, because the days are evil. What are a few of the things that we learn from this particular verse? Paul is saying time is important for us to focus on, to determine how it is that we are actually going to use it. It's not just something that as it comes, we deal with it. We're actually supposed to think about it. We are supposed to redeem it. We are supposed to buy it back. We are supposed to capture it. We are supposed to make the use of the time that we have been given this universal commodity that we all have. In this paying careful attention is a sense that you're actually looking and you're actually examining and you're actually thinking through what it is that you have in front of you. Frequently, you might experience times in your week to say, yeah, I just, I, 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 didn't, it didn't, I didn't realize when this was gonna happen and this was gonna happen and this was gonna happen that this was gonna be required of me and this was gonna be required of me. And most of that is, is because we just didn't order things properly. We just didn't think about what it is that's in front of us and how it is that we can best use that time to glorify God. And this is why Paul says, pay careful attention. Not just to attention, it's this idea of really looking into and examining the time that you have been given and how is it being used. And one of the reasons that we are to make the most of this time, we are to redeem this time, is because of this. The days are evil. This hasn't changed. It hasn't gotten better. The days are still evil. And therefore, what we have to realize is what we are fighting against is a use of time for God's glory versus a use of time for evil purposes. This is what we're fighting against. 
We generally try to put things in a, what I would call this big neutral bucket. Like the things that fit in this bucket really don't matter. It's kind of like our, our free time, or it's kind of like if you have a budget, it's your fun money. I can just do whatever with that particular money in that particular time. But Paul is warning us. He's saying that the days are evil, and we have to watch out because if we aren't capturing that time and redeeming that time for God's glory and for God's purposes, then more than likely what we're doing is we have slipped into using them for evil, selfish purposes, fulfilling our sinful desires, all the different kinds of ways that we can be tempted away from our walk with God. So therefore, what we want to be is wise people, not unwise people. Scripture puts people in two buckets, wise or unwise. Matter of fact, in Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, we learn this, that teach us to number our days so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. As we are stewarding this calling of our time, we are to recognize that while we have this time as a universal commodity, as 24 hours, there is a set number of days that are in front of us. We don't know what those are. That could be 70, it could be 80, it could be tomorrow. We do not know what it is that God has to bring for us. Matter of fact, in James chapter 2, verse 14, we learn that our life is a vapor. And it could be here one moment and gone the next. And so what the psalmist does in this particular passage in Psalm 90, verse 12, is that teach us to number our days brings about wisdom in our heart. Because when we number our days, we start to weigh them we start to evaluate them. We we determine what's most important to do. You do this, not necessarily this particular way. You do this when the tyranny of the urgent comes up. You weigh how many moments you have before something is due. And all that time that you weren't spending ahead of time, you all of a sudden find the time to focus on it and get it done. What you're doing at that point in time is you're numbering the days, you're numbering the hours that you have left that's beforehand. And what the psalmist says in this passage is, no, back up. Look at that at not just the tyranny of the urgent, but look at that as your life and how it is that you use your times in that way. So how do we steward our time well? And this sense of ownership that we have to understand that this is God's time, not our time that's here, we start with the question of, how may I use this time to glorify God? If we think about things as God's ownership of time and how it is that we can best glorify him, it begins to rewire our thinking. We hope that maybe just passively, maybe we glorify God, but actively we are to be glorifying God as we assess the time that's before us, as we look the things that are there. It's also how is it that we can stop and we can think about the time. You know, I recently read an article that I had shared with the staff and the elders that had gotten me thinking quite a bit as to how it is that we fill our time. And this was actually a secular article, not a, not a Christian article. But it basically the, the, it intrigued me because I'm a, I'm a news junkie. I love the news. I, I'm not even going to tell you how many news apps I have on my devices. It's embarrassing, and I'm constantly checking them. And the title of this article was, Stop Reading the News. And immediately, that caught my attention. I'm like, okay, how am I to stop reading the news? And what the author pointed out, and I think this is helpful, and it's even more helpful as we apply it from a Christian rubric. He said, we've lost our ability to think. Because everything is just simply consuming information, not necessarily understanding. Because to understand, you have to think and you have to process. We live our life off headlines. Matter of fact, most of the time that you talk to people and they're like, did you know here such and such? They actually haven't read the article. That's the secret. They do the same thing you do. They've just looked at the title. Guess what? Most of the time, because of them trying to get you to pay attention to what you have, the title actually has nothing to do with the content of the article itself. But yet we're sucked into it, and we lose our ability to think. 
And because of all of these things that we fill our time with, we as Christians have lost the ability to stop and to think about time, to count our days, let wisdom develop in our hearts. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be aware of what's going on in the world around us, but is it dominating our time? Is it controlling our time as we look at these things? It's scary when you're left alone to your thoughts. It's especially scary when you're left alone to your thoughts and you're allowing God's word to weigh them and to weigh your life because it makes you face some uncomfortable decisions. Is something right? Is something wrong? Does it bring gloriness to God? Now, let me do give a warning here with this time. There's, there's some people in this world that go, oh yeah, I like this. This is good. I can start to pull back my schedule. Let me warn you at the same time against laziness. There is a category of people out there that it's not just simply business, but laziness is actually their sin of choice. And everything is how I can pare back, pare back, pare back, pare back, pare back so that I don't actually have to do anything. That's a different issue of stewarding our calling, uh, our, our calling properly, is that we have to realize is that it's not busyness and it's not laziness, but it's using this time effectively for God's glory. When I say that sense of laziness, let me just say is that we also don't want to rule out because this is very much a scriptural con concept when it comes to this use of time is the idea of rest. Don't discount the idea of rest. Use opportunities that you have to, to re replenish your soul just from a sleep perspective. Because sometimes the days and the thoughts, so many things weigh on you that you're at a place where your body isn't able to keep up with what you're trying to do in life. This is why it is, I think, that God set out this idea of a Sabbath rest to bring up this focus on him and this slowing down from life that's there. Again, this doesn't mean that all of life always slows down, but this does mean that as we weigh our time, there's an intentionality when it comes to that sense of rest that's there. Relish those moments. Relish those moments of that time of sitting on the porch, and just resting. Relish those times. Ask God to use those times to replenish your soul. Fight that temptation of picking up the phone and scrolling through it. Look at the beauty of God's creation that's around you and think about and meditate on God's goodness and greatness. And I think that you'll find that time nourishing for your soul as you think about what it is that you have in front of you. Think about it in the way of your families. Now we're all at different stages of life in this room. We have some that have small kids, some that have kids that are in the middle school, older elementary, high school. We have some that have kids that are out of the house. And, you know, the funny thing is, is whatever stage of life you get into, you think, oh, if we just get here, it's going to be different. It's actually not. We just fill it with different things that are there. But think about, especially at the time that you have your kids in your house, how it is that you order your time as a family. They're learning from you. They're learning from you a lot by the things that you do, not necessarily the things that you say. You know this when this comes up, especially when you have to correct one of them and you correct one of them in certain area and they throw it right back at you. But dad, you do this and you recognize they're watching, they're learning from that. Now we all know the whole, you know, do as I say, not as I do kind of a thing. I'm a sinner and it's a good opportunity to talk to your kids about that but not just in those kind of really bad traits that we have, but just how it is that we use our time in general can speak so much. Do kids see from you that you are ordering your day in such a way that you are thinking that this time is a resource that is God's that he has given to you that you are stewarding well and using for his glory? Do they see that you are making decisions about their time that help them see that 
is a part of your gospel witness to them as to what it is that God wants from his believers. And that goal is he's drawing them unto himself. You are painting a picture for them as the Christian life. We fill their time with lots and lots of things. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves the question, are they actually helpful? Are they helpful? They might be fun, but are they helpful when it comes to helping them understand how to order their days? So there's a lot when it comes to stewarding our time. And what I want us to do is I want us to, if you were to walk away with one thing when it comes to stewarding our time moving and moving from frazzled to faithful is this, stop and start to think. That's what I want to encourage you to do. Get your order right. Get God's ownership of time set correctly in your mind. And then stop and think and look at how your time is spent throughout the week and determine, is this helpful? Is it faithful? Is it something that brings glory unto God? If it doesn't, I would encourage you, stop it. Now, let me put a caveat there. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to enjoy anything. That we're just supposed to be in this constant state of not having anything in life to enjoy. God has called us to enjoy life. This is an abundant life that he's called us to. And in 1 Timothy 6, we're told that he is the, the giver of good gifts and he gives gifts that we are to enjoy. The problem is, is with our time, is when those kinds of gifts that he's given to us become the object of our worship. We no longer worship the gift giver, but we worship the gift that he has given instead. And that's where it's flipped into idol worship. That's where it's flipped into no longer glorifying God. We can enjoy some great things that God has given to us. As we properly are able to look at those things and say, this is by God's grace that I've been able to experience this, and I'm thankful for the fact that this has happened, and enjoy those things. But don't turn them simply into idol worship. So again, stop and think. How is my day? How is my week ordered? How is my family ordered in these particular things? Let's go into our second area. Our second area is stewarding our calling and our talents. I'm going to call this moving from reticent to ready. God's gifted you in so many different ways. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, uh, we see when the concept of spiritual gifts, and Dr. Ecker hit on this as well from Ephesians chapter 4 yesterday, but we learn that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, that this manifestation of the Spirit has been given to each person for the common good. You have been given something from God. As a believer in Christ, as a follower of God, you have been given something through the power of the Spirit that you have for the use of blessing other people. Now, we can expand this simply beyond spiritual gifts, but we also see in Scripture the concept of skills and talents that we all have. Each of us have, has a part to play. 1 Corinthians 12 lays this out of how it is that we all are part of this body and how it is that we all are working. You see, the world looks at its gifts and its skills, and they look at it in the way of how does this bring a benefit to themselves, but instead, in stewarding our calling in the area of our talents, we are to ask how the gifts and skills that he has given is to be used to honor the Lord and to bless other people. That's what we're doing when it comes to stewarding our calling with gifts. Three, chapter, seven, or chapter 3, verse 17 tells us this, when it comes to the way in which we work, not just in the sense of our gifts, but the way that we work itself, or the way that we serve. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We do this as ambassadors of Christ, as ambassadors of our heavenly Father. Doing this for a purpose as a representative of him as if we are set on a mission to accomplish something. Think about it, you know, if you tell somebody, you tell your kid, I need you to go do X. I need you to go get X for me. They go do it on your behalf. In other words, let's, let's say it's one of those moments where they're actually happy and joyful about the fact that you've asked them to do something. And they go and they do it and they do it with haste. 
And they bring it back to you in this sense because they're doing it as a representative to you and using this calling that you've placed on their life. And likewise for us on a daily basis as we work and we serve, no matter the context that we've been placed in, whether we're earning our paycheck from a company, from a church, from a retirement account, it doesn't matter at that point in time. We are using that time to work as unto the Lord. Likewise, with this other's focus, we see in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. It says, Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. In our life, we have lots of levers that we get to pull when it comes to when we use the talents and the gifts that God has given us. And many times we pull back on the wrong levers. We leave the levers in place that are focused on how it is that these gifts and talents can benefit us. And we pull back on the levers that bless other people because we need me time. Now, this doesn't, again, mean that we don't rest like we talked about in the first point, but we get to a place sometimes where we pull back on most of these particular areas. Another way to think about this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Paul says here as he writes to the church in Philippi and encourages us as well, do nothing out of selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. And everyone should not look to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. The mindset in which we look is by putting others in front of ourselves and by thinking of others in this particular way. I hope one of the things that you're hearing all throughout this is how we're carrying out the first and second greatest command. The first greatest command to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our mind and our strength. And the second is to love one another as ourselves. This is how we fulfill the law of Christ. This is how Christ says the entire law is summed up in these particular ways as we steward these resources and these talents that God has given us. Now, when it comes to us misstewarding these talents that we have, there's, there's different ways that we come up with excuses when it comes to being able to fulfill these particular things. We use the excuse of time. I don't have time to do it. Well, we've already talked about the issue of time. You're needing to reorder your time, which then allows you to be able to more fully use the gifts and the skills and the talents that God has given you to reorder that particular time. We use the, excre- the excuse of frequency. I did it last month. Lord, if we think that all God wants us to do is use our gifts once a month, we have seriously undersold what God wants from our lives. We've seriously undersold what God wants from our lives. That's where we get to the last slice of pie rather than our faith invading every part of the pie when we think that that last time that we served once a month ago is enough. Excuse of lack of appreciation. No one's recognized me. No one's thanked me for doing this. So therefore, I'm not going to serve anymore. You serve for the glory of your heavenly Father, not for the praise of man. Now, we should honor one another. Scripture says that we should honor one another. And we, should, as a matter of fact, in, this, in the concept of the gifts, we're learned that we should even honor those that have less honorable gifts, less showy gifts in those ways, and those things should happen. But yet our, our service shouldn't be built upon this sense of whether or not appreciation was shown. That's how the world operates. The world operates on, I'll scratch your back if you scratch your mind, the quid pro quo situation. But that's not how we act as a body of believers. And then there's also the excuse of someone else will do it. Let me explain it in this particular way. The email goes out. Let's just use a sense of it. We'll use the context of church. The email goes out. The mass email. You know, the one that goes to everybody. We need people to do X. Do you know what typically the response is to those? It's crickets. You think, oh, there's going to be enough people to respond to that. I don't need to respond to that. 
But here's the thing. That's what everybody else is thinking. The idea is when one of those comes is that we should say, I am ready. I'm not reticent. I'm not waiting for somebody to ask. I'm ready to use the gifts and the talents that God has given me and steward them in this purpose for his glory. This can be done outside of the church. You know, the dreaded call when a, when a, when a friend, a believer especially, needs help moving, and you find out they have a sleeper sofa on the second floor, And all of a sudden, ah, I don't know if I'm available. But this is how it is that we reorder our life when we come to stewarding our calling through the talents that God has given us, thinking about other people first. Let me put it forward to you this way. If you view your talents as gifts from God to be used for other people's benefits, you're going to treat them one way. But if you view them is things that you're good at that other people are going to be blessed to experience, you're going to treat them another way. Let me say that again. If you view your talents and gifts from God to be used for other people's benefits, you're going to treat them one way. But if you view them as things that you're good at and that other people are going to be blessed to experience, you treat them another way. One is self-centered. The other is God-centered. The other is God has given you these things. These are his. He has entrusted to you to steward these particular things for the benefit of other people. The other is people are just blessed to be around you. And we're not stewarding our calling right in those particular areas. Let's go to our third category. Stewarding our calling and our treasure. Moving from selfish to selfless. All right, the last area is money. Everybody buckle up. This is the hard conversation that anyone ever has. You're like, okay, mess with my time, mess with how it is that I serve other people, but let's not mess with my money, okay? But this is one of the most significant areas in our life that we can learn how it is to steward the calling that God has placed in our life as we move from selfish to selfless. You know, we are blessed with a wealth of resources. Even those that don't have many resources here, especially in this country, are blessed with a wealth of resources that are there. You might not think so because you're living beyond your means, but you actually have a wealth of resources that have been given to you. And this is why it is that we must think about how it is that we reorder these things. You see, our budgets, whether they're explicit in the fact that you are a budgeter and you like to do it, or whether they're implicit, you're working off of just kind of concepts in your brain as to how much you're spending your money on. Uh, usually start with filling out your basic needs and then you fulfill your desires. And then like that pie, if something is left over, it could be given towards kingdom work. If something is left over, that last piece of the pie. But yet these are God's resources that are here. They're his, he owns them all. Haggai chapter two Verses 8 and 9 says that once more in a little while, I'll shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land, and I will bring forth the wealth of the nations because the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. It's all his. It's how it is that we're using his resources that were there. I don't, when somebody says that they don't have enough to give, it's really a false cry. It's really because things are not prioritized correctly in their life. Now, I'm not advocating giving yourself into poverty. That's not the goal. The goal is not to give yourself into poverty. Now, if for some reason the Lord calls you that, then so be it. Take that road if that's the case. But I don't think that's the call that's been placed on the Christian life. But I am advocating that you seek first God's kingdom and you let him provide the rest. God's made some promises to us in Scripture. And what I want to put forth you put forth to you is take hold of those promises. Believe them. You see, there's a difference between trusting God's promises and putting them to the test. We are not to put the Lord, the God, to the test. We put them to the test when we're trying to do something to see if he'll fulfill something just purely out of selfish desires. We're trusting the Lord's promises when we do it because he's called us to do it and then we're trusting this is going to be the case. Let's look at a couple of these. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. 
When it comes to this, it says the point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The person who sows generously will also reap generously. So promises that are given here. Each person should do as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver, the attitude in which we're supposed to give. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way also, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. The attitude that's being put forth here is that first, we are taking God's resources and we are using them to bless other people in his kingdom work. And that we're then trusting because of this faithfulness that God is providing for us in all the other areas. I encourage people as they think about their budget, whether explicit or implicit, figure out your giving first, then figure out the rest. Let me say that again. Figure out your giving first, then figure out the rest. And trust that God is going to be able to provide for you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, instruct those who are rich in this present age, not to be arrogant or to set this hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all these things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good and to be rich in good works and to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take a hold of what is truly life. You go, hey, that's great instruction. Generally, when we hear this particular verse, we think of other people. Yeah, that would be good for this person to hear. They've got lots of resources. It would be good for them to hear this verse. But keep in mind, especially in our context, most all of us fit into this particular verse into the wealth and the resources that God has given to us. He's saying that there is something that is truly life and something there is not. That which is truly life is taking the resources that God has given you and using them as a blessing towards other people. But even if you're not convinced that you're in that category of one of those people in 1 Timothy 6, you say, I'm poor. Let me give to you the perspective of the poor. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches in Macedonia during a severe trial brought about by affliction. Their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity in their part. Out of their poverty, they gave beyond even their means. And they were able to do that because of God's blessings, trusting God's promises. Likewise, Luke 21, 1 through 4. He looked up and he saw the rich dropping their offerings in the treasury temple, and he also saw a poor widow dropping in two tiny coins. And he says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more in than all of them. For all those people have put in gifts out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Trusting in God's provision and God's promises. Because If we follow his commands and we're faithful, we trust that God remains faithful to us in that pattern. The love of money has led many astray. And for many people, it's one of the most significant barriers that they have in the walk with Christ. This is why it is that Christ said that it was to the rich young ruler. This is why it is that he put forth a hard standard. This is why it is that Christ said that it is hard for a rich man to come into the kingdom of heaven because of the difficulty that they have with wealth. And generally we say, as again, think about other people in that category, but it's good for us to insert ourselves in there and ask ourselves, how is money ruling our life? Do we recognize that this is God's resource that is there? The interesting thing about the country that we live in, this huge blessing that we have to live in America, is that we have the ability to experience all that life has to offer. We can do some incredible things, see some incredible things that are there, but have we truly experienced life in the way that we're using the resources that God has given us? See, steward on our calling as we close today is a high bar. It's a high bar, but remember this, what Jesus said, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. How is that possible? You might think about reorganizing your time, using your talents in the proper order, 
reorganizing your finances. You might be thinking about all these things and go, how in the world is this even possible? Remind yourself that Jesus said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And that's because we have something that the rest of the world doesn't have. We have the power of the Spirit in our life to help us walk faithfully before God. We have the ability to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer and lift these things up for Him and put these burdens before Him and trust Him as He leads us in these ways. We don't, we don't do these things in our own power, but under the power of the Spirit. So as we leave this morning, here's what, again, I want to encourage you to do, much like with the first point. You need to assess. Look at your calendar. Look at your app on your phone as to your finances. Think about the talents and the skills that God has given you. All of these things and ask yourself, am I using them way? Using them correctly? Am I stewarding them well? You know what? If you want to lose weight, what do you do? You start counting calories. Still the most effective way. If you want to lose weight, you start counting calories. Likewise, if you want to budget better, if you want to save more money, you start budgeting. And all of a sudden you're able to do it because you're sitting down and you're assessing and you're weighing to determine whether or not things are in the proper order. So in stewarding our calling, what I want you to do is make an inventory of your days and weeks. Think about your talents, think about your resources and ask yourself the question, do I understand ownership correctly? Am I following what scripture says? Am I applying biblical wisdom to these particular areas so that we can steward our calling well? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a good and a gracious God. And as I say these things this morning, I don't say them from having figured out for even my personal life as to not how to slip into sin in these areas. But I come to you as a sinner, redeemed by the grace of God, who has the ability to live life faithfully before you by the power of your spirit. Lord, help us all to assess, to weigh, to think through, so we can determine, are we st stewarding our time, our talents, and our treasures for your glory? And we pray these things in your mighty, wonderful, and gracious name. Amen. Mm -hmm.